Okay, Daniel chapter 5. Daniel 5, who is king? Belshazzar. Belshazzar is the king of Babylon here in Daniel chapter 5. And he was having a party. And he was showing how great he was. And he was a man that appeared to have everything. And lots of money and gold and silver. He had women. He had power. In some people's eyes, we could say he had everything, that he lacked nothing. But as he's living his life and enjoying all that, what happens? Those mysterious fingers start writing on the wall. And what do they write? Mene, mene, teko, usari. He didn't know what it meant. What was the meaning? So Daniel comes. And he interprets it for him. And part of the interpretation is verse 27. Tekel. What is the meaning of Tekel? He says, you are weighed in the balances and are found wanting. Verse 27, you're weighed in the balances and are found wanting. Again, Belshazzar seemed like a man who seemed to have everything. Seemed like he lacked nothing. He wasn't missing anything in life. But when he was weighed, the idea is the scale and you compare two things. When he was weighed, when he was compared to what God sees and God's standards, he wasn't found equal. He was found on the bottom. Which it up. It's heavier. It's actually what has more value. He was found wanting. That's what it says. And the reason he was found wanting is because he did not have a relationship with God. So instead of receiving blessings from God, that same night, verse 30, it says, In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. Many people in the world today are like Belshazzar. Seems like they have everything. Seems like they don't lack anything. But in the end, they're found wanting like Belshazzar. They feel like, they're, like they are lacking something. Because they don't have a relationship with God. So the question I want us to consider tonight as we go into Luke 22 is how do we feel about our lives? Do you feel like you lack something in your life? That's the question we're going to consider tonight. Is something missing in our lives? Are we lacking in some way? And we'll attempt to answer that question through Luke 22. And reminder, so it's been a week since I was preaching out of Luke 22, but... He was having the final Pesach Seder with his disciples. This would be Yeshua's last Pesach because very soon he would be hanging on the cross. He would be crucified the next day. And so as that Seder was coming to an end, Yeshua still had a lot to tell his disciples. What we read starting in verse 35 is this is what he, one of the things he said to them. He said unto them, this is Luke 22, verse 35, when I sent you without purse, and scrip, purse is what you carry money in, scrip, it's a bag you carry your food in, and shoes, lacked you anything? And they said, nothing. The disciples learned that they lacked nothing. But in order to understand what 
Yeshua is talking about here, we need to, to back up a bit all the way back to Luke chapter 9. No, that's my favorite thing to do is take, keep taking you back. But uh, it's good to remember because Luke builds on himself. Luke 9. What was Yeshua referring to in Luke 22? If you remember back in Luke 9, from verses 1 to 6, he sent the 12 out. He said he gave them power and authority. In verse 1, he gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey. Don't take staves, don't take walking sticks, don't take a script. Neither bread, don't take a bag for food, don't take extra food, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. And whatsoever house you enter into, there abide and, and there depart. And whosoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. And it's Luke 9 verses 1 to 6. So Yeshua had a special and an urgent mission for his disciples. They were to go and preach the kingdom of God and to do these signs to prove that the kingdom was indeed coming. And to do the, due to the urgency of the mission, he told them, just go. Don't spend extra time gathering things, getting prepared. Just go. Don't, it says, take nothing for your journey. Don't take your walking stick, your, your bag of food, extra food, money. Just go. Just go, do this mission. Don't worry about carrying extra supplies. And for a couple of years, the disciples did just that. They went out with nothing. In fact, they gave up everything they did have in order to follow him. For the past two years, they did that, but they also realized God provided for all of their physical needs. For the past two years, they didn't stock up on their food supplies, but they never starved to death. And even when they didn't know where the food was going to come from, God provided it from somewhere. Think of the, the feeding of the 5,000. They asked the question, where are we going to get food, not just for ourselves, but all these people? But Yeshua consistently provided for their needs. For the past two years, they had gone without a lot of money. They couldn't always have enough money to pay for shelter to sleep as they traveled around. Yet they always had a place to sleep. Yeshua always provided. At that time, the hospitality of their fellow Jews would open up their homes to them. At that point, they still kind of liked Yeshua, so they were okay with him and his disciples and allowed him, them to sleep in their homes. So for the past two years, as we come here to Luke 22, the Lord showed them that he provided for all of these needs. As they served him, they had food to eat when they needed food, and they had a place to sleep when they needed a place to sleep. And now in Luke 22, as this Pesach is coming to an end, this meal, the Seder, is coming to an end, just one day before Yeshua's crucifixion, he asked them the question, verse 35 that we just read. When I did this to you, when I sent you, Without the purse, without the script and shoes, lacked you anything? I sent you without a purse to carry money. I sent you without a bag to carry the food. But during these past two years, did you lack anything? And they said, nothing. We lacked nothing. They were told not to take, not to take anything with them. Not food, not money, yet after, yet after all these journeys, 
They could testify that they never lacked anything that they needed. God was always found faithful to provide for their needs. And their testimony is very similar to the children of Israel. If you look at Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 21, Nehemiah 9, 21, he's explaining what the children of Israel experience 40 years in the desert. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 21. And he reminds us there, said, Yea, 40 years to sustain them in the wilderness so that they lacked nothing. Their clothes waxed not old and their feet swelled not. For 40 years, God could say that the children of Israel lacked nothing. They had food, they had shelter even in their disobedience. For 40 years, God was there with the children of Israel in the desert, providing for their needs. And we see here that same God that provided for them, provided for the 12 disciples, providing for all their needs, so that they can come to the conclusion that they lacked nothing. Our God is a faithful God who provides for the needs of his people. It may not always be what we expect, or even what we want sometimes, but it's always what we need. Moses understood this. Twelve disciples understood this. And we today need to understand that as well. God is faithful to provide for the needs of his people. So that we understand that we really, like them, lack nothing. So verse 35, Yeshua reminds them, These two years when I told you not to bring anything, I still provided for you. Then he says in verse 36, back in Luke 22, verse 36, Then he said unto them, But now. Uh-oh. That should cause a little bit of worry or fear in the disciples at that point. Because when you hear the words, but now, it indicates a change in the situation. But now, what's, what's going to change now, Yeshua? It says, but now, he that had the purse, if you have a purse, for carrying money, a money bag, let him take it. And likewise, his scrip, the bag that you carry your food in, take that with you. And he that has no sword, let him sell his garment, his clothes, and buy one. Things are changing now. And by saying what he says here in verse 36, he wasn't saying that God was going to stop providing for all those needs. He was still teaching them to trust him. But now he's also going to provide something else in a much greater way. In a spiritual way. They already learned that they lacked nothing physically. The next lesson is to learn that they lacked nothing spiritually. Because Yeshua's disciples were about to enter a spiritual battlefield. Things were about to get rough. talked a lot about this spiritual battlefield over the past few months. And it's not to say that the disciples had an easy road up until now. Things were, were difficult. But things were about to get much more difficult for them. Yeshua was about to be crucified. And severe persecution was going to come for each of them. The Jews would soon change their view of Yeshua and his disciples. Remember what I said back in Luke 19. On Sunday of this same week, when Yeshua rode into Jerusalem on the donkey, what were they saying? 
They loved it that he was coming. They were hailing a king. Blessed be the Lord. Blessed be the king that comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. It's from Luke 19, 38. But then as we'll see, by Friday of the same week, that same crowd was shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Things were changing. Things were about to change very quickly. Persecution was coming. First, Yeshua would be hated and killed. Then his disciples would be hated and persecuted and then killed a lot of them. The disciples could no longer at that point rely on the hospitality of their fellow Jews for food and shelter like they did before. So Yeshua says, but now, take a money bag with you. Take a bag to carry food. Yeshua is preparing them for a critical change in their lives. Things are going to get rough, so take some extra money, take some extra food. Not only that, but he adds something here that he didn't mention in Luke 9. It says, take a sword. If you don't have a sword, sell some clothes and get a sword. Get ready to defend yourselves because opposition is coming. Essentially, Yeshua is telling them to make preparations for the battle that's coming. The people that hate me and want me dead are the same people that are going to hate you and want you dead as well. So he told them to get swords. But the real battle would be spiritual, not physical. What Yeshua was saying was, prepare yourselves for a spiritual battle that's coming. But the disciples, so often as they do, they didn't understand. They thought they needed real, physical swords. And so what do they do? We see in verse 38, they talk among each other, and they're able to come up with two swords. They said, behold, we're able to have two swords. And what did Yeshua say? It is enough. What he means, it doesn't mean that two swords are enough for the 12 of you. Obviously, two swords can't do very much. But when he said it is enough, he's basically ending the conversation. He's realizing that they didn't fully understand the gravity of what was coming. They were still weren't ready for the crucifixion coming within less than 24 hours. Even though Yeshua kept mentioning his crucifixion. Even here in verse 37, he reminds them, he tells them again that he's going to be crucified. It says, For I say unto you that this that is written must be accomplished in me. And then he quotes Isaiah 53. And he was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. And once again, we're reminded of that cross that was coming for Yeshua. That burden that was on his mind and heart. And we'll see that as we eventually get to the Garden of Gethsemane, how heavy that burden was for him. Understanding he is God, but he also was man. Soon he would be crucified. And it would all be according to prophecy. Again, in verse 37, he's quoting from Isaiah 53, verse 12. He was reckoned among the transgressors. And the very next day, Yeshua would be nailed to a cross, treated like a common criminal, hung between two common criminals, fulfilling this prophecy, even though he was innocent. He was the innocent, sinless Lamb of God. It all must be accomplished, he says in verse 37, reminding us that God, from the beginning, had this plan to send Yeshua to the cross. It needed to be accomplished, he says. 
This that is written must be yet accomplished. This word accomplished, the word accomplished in English is interesting in the old Old English, it means achieving full success. That's what accomplish means, to, to have full success. Okay? So we see that it must, his crucifixion must be accomplished. It doesn't mean, again, that Judas Iscariot won by betraying him. It doesn't mean that the Romans won or, or the Jewish leaders won. What it means is that God planned for this to happen. It was the designed end of what needed to happen. And it was a complete success. He accomplished it. They didn't send him there by their uh, victory. It was God's victory over sin. A complete success of God's plan. Determined from the beginning that Yeshua would die on the cross for our sins. And it was going to happen soon, whether or not the disciples realized it. He was going to leave them. But even knowing he was going to leave them, he would make sure that they still lacked nothing, even after he left. The disciples already learned that they could trust God to provide for all their needs. And now, as Yeshua was about to leave them, he was teaching them how to depend on the same God for their spiritual needs. Even in the middle of the severe persecution and hatred that was coming for them. Just as the Lord provided food and shelter, the same Lord would provide for all their spiritual needs as well. Just as they could say we lacked nothing physically in verse 35, Yeshua was about to teach them that they would lack nothing spiritually even after he left. So to realize what Yeshua promised them exactly, we need to turn from here because at the same time as he was saying these things, he said a lot more as recorded in John. In John chapters 14 to 17. So Luke just records a few things he says at the end of the, the meal there. But then we get to John, verses 14 to 17. There's a lot. John chapter. Chapters 14 to 17 is everything that Yeshua said at this time to his disciples. Before they leave the upper room and head towards the Garden of Gethsemane. And so obviously I'm not going to cover all these chapters. I just want to focus on something specific that Yeshua promised his disciples to make sure that they would lack nothing spiritually in the spiritual battle coming for them. Because again, he knew that spiritual battle was coming. He wanted to let them know what he's going to do to make sure they lacked nothing in that battle. Let's start by looking at John 15. Verses 18 and 19. John 15, verses 18 and 19. And we looked at these verses not too long ago. But he says, If the world hate you, do you know that it hated me before it hated you? If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of this world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. As believers in Yeshua, we should expect some level of persecution. Why does the world hate us? It's because of our association with Yeshua, who they hate. That is the, the, the bottom line reason why this hatred comes against followers of Yeshua. It says, the world hates me, therefore the world will hate you because you identify with me. And then in John 16, verses 2 and 3, he predicts some specific persecution. John 16, verses 2 and 3 says, they'll put you out of the synagogues. Okay, the time comes that whosoever kills you will think that he does God service. 
And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. So again, like I said earlier, up to this point, many Jews were favorable towards Yeshua and his disciples. They were okay with him and his teaching and all that. But things were changing. And after the crucifixion, many more Jews would reject him and his followers. He's telling them that some of you are going to get kicked out of your synagogues that you like to go to. They don't want anything to do with you. And it says even in that verse, that some are going to try to kill you. And when the disciples heard Yeshua say this, I would imagine they maybe got a little worried. I don't know what you would feel if, if you were there in their place. What are we going to do? How are we going to be brave and strong against this persecution that's coming, against these people that are going to hate us, want to kill us? kicking us out of the synagogues, treating us as outcasts. Especially since Yeshua won't be with us anymore to give us direction, to help us. And so Yeshua makes them a promise. Again, he makes sure that they lack nothing. And that promise is back in John chapter 14. John 14 Verses 16 to 18. It says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So as we consider the situation of these 12 disciples, persecution that's coming, the hatred that's coming to them for their faith, as we consider our own situation today as believers in our spiritual battles, we need to remember something very important that God did for us spiritually to make sure that we lack nothing in this battle. It says in verse 18, God will not leave you comfortless. I will give you the comforter. You're going to face many spiritual battles in life. There's going to be things and people that will try to discourage you, try to maybe destroy your faith even. But remember what he says here. The promise is God will not leave you comfortless. Instead, he has given us the comforter. He made sure that we lack nothing in this spiritual battle. Yeshua was saying to his disciples, I'm leaving you. I comforted you while I was with you. But don't worry, even after I leave, you will have another comfort. Comforter is the spirit of truth. In verse 17, we know him as the Holy Spirit. He's given us the Holy Spirit in our spiritual battles. We're in a spiritual battle, but Yeshua has not let us, not left us without the comforter. What does that word comforter mean? It literally means one who comes beside you to help you. That's one of the main meanings of this word. And true comfort means that the Holy Spirit is there in order to help you, to strengthen you, to strengthen you in these battles. That English word, our English word comfort actually means with strength. Comforter is there to give us the spiritual strength that we need. True comfort isn't just making somebody feel good. Sometimes people think they're comforting others by saying things even if they aren't really good for the person to hear or they're not even true things. But true comfort is giving true strength in your problems. True strength, true courage to face the trials. As a believer, we need to remember we're not alone in our trials. 
Bible tells us the Holy Spirit has come to us, that he actually dwells in us. Yeshua promises that here in verse 17. He says, he will dwell with you and shall be in you. He's a comforter in us to strengthen us. We're not alone. We're not without a comforter. We're not comfortless, as it says in verse 18. I don't know what your translation says, but this word comfortless actually means orphans. Maybe in the Russian it just says orphans. Orphans. Orphans are alone in this world. Okay? They often don't have help. That's actually how Rachel and I met each other. Not, not as orphans, but going to the Ukraine and helping orphans. We saw firsthand how lonely some of these kids are. Orphans are, are alone. But Yeshua says we're not alone. We're not like orphans. We have someone with us always to comfort us. Strengthen us in the battle that is before us. And you know, this comforter that gives us strength also gives us peace in the battle. Shalom. Disciples, again, we're about to enter some very hard times. But Yeshua repeats several times in these chapters in John of how they would still have peace even in the middle of these trials. The Comforter would allow them to have this peace. Let's look at John 14, verse 27. John 14, verse 27. It says, Peace. I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He's going to give us promise of peace. Let not your heart be troubled. Let it not be afraid. Again, he's saying this knowing the hatred, the persecution that was coming to them. He said, I'm leaving peace. Don't be afraid. Don't be troubled. Be comforted. Be strengthened. Even when these terrible things will come. John 16, verse 33. John 16, verse 33. It says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. There's the contrast. In Yeshua we have peace. In the world we have tribulation. But, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We don't need to be afraid. We don't need to let our hearts be troubled. We can be strengthened. We can be encouraged, comforted by what Yeshua has already done on the cross. And by knowing he's given us the comfort. You'll have tribulation in this world, but you'll also be able to have peace. Conundrum, paradise. We can have peace even in the middle of tribulation. Yeshua was telling them it's going to get difficult in your lives. You'll have tribulation, but still spiritually you will lack nothing. The comforter, comforter will be beside you to help you. He'll give you peace in the middle of your trials. What is peace? What is shalom? What's the meaning of shalom? Peace is much more than just saying I don't have problems. Okay? People can have peace and still have problems in their lives. Peace, shalom has, you know, as we know the Hebrew, it has to do with being complete, being whole. Okay? Shalom. It's, and feeling complete and whole means you feel like you lack nothing. Have true peace means that you feel like you lack nothing. You feel like you're complete. A lot of people go through this life without peace because they feel like something's missing. And they search for it here and there, and different things, and never find it. They don't find the shalom. They don't have true shalom, true peace. They don't feel complete. They feel like they lack something. But for us, in Yeshua, the Holy Spirit, can feel whole, complete, true shalom. 
Like we lack nothing. It's only the peace God can give. It's only possible through Yeshua's work on the cross. That gives us true peace. We have peace through Yeshua's work on the cross. Without faith in Yeshua, we have anything but peace. Romans 5.10 says we're enemies of God. It's a place you don't want to be in. There's no way you can have peace if you're an enemy of the holy creator of the universe. Our sin separates us from a holy God. And so without faith in Yeshua, we're seriously lacking this relationship. We don't have a relationship with God if we don't have faith in Yeshua's work on the cross. But by Yeshua dying on the cross, he paid that penalty for our sins. The penalty was dead. He paid that penalty with his blood. He made it possible for us to have a relationship with him so that we're no longer enemies of God. But what does John say? We're actually friends of God. He uses the word friends. John 15. Turn to John 15. John 15, verses 13 to 15. We are now friends because of what Yeshua has done on the cross. Because of his love. And it says, greater love had no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Hence for I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. This word friends, it's not like the 70s, I think they had this idea of Yeshua is like buddy, buddy, Yeshua is your buddy. What it means is that we don't have this enemy relationship with God anymore. We have peace. There's nothing separating us anymore. And so as we consider all this, let's go back, close with the question I asked us in the beginning. Do you feel like you're lacking something in your life? If yes, then we have to ask ourselves two more questions. Number one, to make sure we've trusted in Yeshua. I trust each of you have done that. It's the only way we can go from being an enemy of God to a friend of God is to trust in Yeshua's work on the cross as a perfect sinless substitute in our place. We should have died on the cross. He died for us. If we trust in that, we believe in him, it says we'll have eternal life. We'll be friends with our creator. Our next question to ask, if you still feel like you're lacking something, the question is, have we submitted ourselves? He's given us the Holy Spirit. The question is, have we submitted ourselves to what he's given us, to that Holy Spirit that dwells in us? As a born-again believer, the promise is the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And if you still feel like you're lacking something, we need to ask another question. Realizing he's there to help you in spiritual battles, to, to strengthen you, but we need to allow him to work. That brings us to Ephesians, and the last verse we'll go to is Ephesians 5, verse 18. Ephesians 5, 18. What does Paul instruct us in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18? Again, this is, a, this is even in the view of we are in a spiritual war. But he says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. How can you be filled with the Spirit? What does that mean? Simply put, to be filled with the Spirit means to submit yourself to Him, to allow Him to fill you, to work in you. And how do we do that primarily? We do it by obeying the Word of God. He's given us the Word of God to guide us, to instruct us. The Holy Spirit gives us understanding of the Word of God and the ability to obey the Word of God, but we need to be looking at the Word of God for that to happen. 
To be filled with the Spirit means to submit to Him, obey His Word, so that He can do His work in us. If we want to experience all that John talked about, about the comfort and strength that only the Holy Spirit can bring, if we want that unique peace that He promises even in the middle of those battles, then submit your life fully to God and His Word. Let the Holy Spirit work in you. Be filled with the Spirit. It requires time. It requires an investment in prayer and study of His Word. But that's what He's given us. He's given us truth. And John, he also, Yeshua, says he's given, he's given us the truth. He says, sanctify them. Through thy truth, thy word is true. We have the truth that will help us in all of our battles. God's given us everything we need. Just like the 12 disciples, we can honestly say we lack nothing. And we enter this spiritual battle every day, right? We know that every day we go out leave the front door of the battle waiting for us. Sometimes there's a battle already in the house before you get out the door. <laughs> Realize that as well. But we're, we're in that battle. If you're a believer, you're in that battle. You need to realize that as well. This isn't a selective battle. If you believe in Yeshua, you're in the battle. It's not a special forces of believers and the infantry and everybody else, we're all in the battle. But we need to also realize that we lack nothing to fight this battle. He's given us the Holy Spirit, He's given us the Comforter to comfort us, to help us, to strengthen us, and give us that peace in the battle. He's given us His Word, the Word of God. We simply need to study it and submit to it. Let's not end up like King Belshazzar as we looked at in the beginning. Seemed like he had a lot, seemed like he didn't lack anything, yet in the end he was found wanting. He was lacking. Let us be men and women who realize that we, as believers in Yeshua, lack nothing. He's given us everything we need. We simply need to use what he's given us. Let's pray.